question before the House is one of awful moment to this country. For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery. Should I keep back my opinions at such time through fear of giving offense? I should consider myself as guilty of treason towards my country. Mr. President, it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. But is this the part of wise men engaged in a great struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be of the number of those who having eyes see not, and having ears hear not, the things which so nearly concern their salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. I know of no way of judging of the future, but by the past. And judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry for the last 10 years to justify those hopes which with gentlemen have been pleased to comfort themselves and the house. Is it the insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourselves, are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation, the last arguments to which wit kings resort. I ask, gentlemen, sir, has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir. She has none. They are meant for us. They can be meant for no other. And what have we to oppose them? Shall we try argument, sir? We have been trying that for the last 10 years. Sir, we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm which is now coming on. We have petitioned, we have remonstrated, we have supplicated, we have prostrated ourselves before the throne and have implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of Parliament. Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult. Our supplications have been disregarded, and we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne. In vain, after these things, may we indulge in the fond hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, we must fight. I repeat it, sir, we must fight. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that is left us. It is vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. The war is actually begun. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. speech by Patrick Henry we call it the give me liberty or give me death speech most of the time but a lot of people don't realize he actually gave that speech without any notes without any preparation he didn't he wasn't reading it it wasn't necessarily planned I'm sure he knew he was going to speak in the convention but he didn't know exactly what he was going to say he was speaking from the heart this was a time in politics where People just got up and spoke from the heart. He was a lawyer, of course. He was accustomed to speaking in public, a well-liked, well-established lawyer in the Virginia area. 
In fact, his speech was so profound that there was a man in the audience that stood up after the speech, after moments had passed, and said, I want to be buried right here uh, at, at the scene of this this moment. It was so powerful. And a Baptist preacher was there in the audience and said it looked like there was a holy fire burning in his eyes when he gave the speech. Others said that he spit and things of that nature. You know, when you're when you're yelling to a room full of people, we're so used to microphones now and we have the luxury of being able to walk into a room full of maybe even a thousand people and just speaking very softly. But in those days, if you wanted to address 100, 200, 300 people in a room or especially outside, you had to have a boom to your voice. You had to, you had to be your own microphone. And, and he was. And it was a pivotal moment. Revolution was already in the air. But many people were still wrestling within themselves whether or not they were going to completely separate from Great Britain and fight the inevitable war that was going to happen if they were going to be completely separated people and become their own country and actually have legitimate freedoms of their own. And Patrick Henry's speech shook Virginia and the colonies at a pivotal moment. And I believe in pivotal moments. I believe that God can use a man, men can be used, whether they realize it or not, at specific times and places in history. I believe that every person has a pivotal moment in their life, may not necessarily be something of the magnitude of the Revolutionary War and the dawning of a new country, the greatest country that has ever survived the ravages of war and time, the United States of America, but every human being has that watershed moment where they have to stand up in front of their peers Kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew boys. There's a moment where you're going to have to stand up and say something, even if it's just something as simple as, oh, no, king, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. We don't have to get a board together. We don't have to sit down and write a three-page paper and communicate with one another about our feelings. We just know we're not going to bend or bow to the idol that you've created to yourself. And we serve a God, you know, he's able to deliver us from the fire if he wants to. And if he doesn't, we'd rather die in the fire than bow to an idol and break the covenant that we have with our God. Every human being has a moment like this, whether it's recorded for posterity and becomes one of the most famous speeches that has ever been spoken into the time frame of human history doesn't matter. God knows it. God sees it. God records it. And it will be recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. Every word that we speak will be recorded. And I believe that we need to be careful and be looking for these opportunities. I think that I believe we're living in an age, an era, to use great big kind of overwhelming words, but we do. We live in an era where things are shifting rapidly. We don't even realize how quickly technology is changing, not only the things around us, but we don't even realize how technology is actually changing us as people. It's it's changing our psychology. It's changing how we interact with one another. So it's it's changing our sociology. It's changing our ideology. It's shaping our worldview. Uh, It's certainly shaping uh, our communications, so to speak. We think that's mostly what it's changing. But in reality, I believe technology is doing more to shape us spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, in, in very subtle and sometimes not so subtle ways. It's just that we refuse to see them. When you go to dinner and you look around a restaurant full of people and everyone's looking down at their phone, that's not subtle, but we just don't notice it because we're probably looking down at our phone too. And so if everybody is caught in the trap, then we don't notice the trap because we're all just stuck in it together, waiting for waiting for that bar to come down and smack us in the cheese at the same time, the proverbial mouse trap. So we have all of this shaping us. The the world is changing us. And the winds, the storm clouds of culture are positioning themselves against Christianity. 
certainly against fundamentalist Christianity, which any apostolic would be kind of squashed into that category or corner, regardless of whether or not it's completely accurate. The world looks at us as as crazy Christians. We're not just Christian. We're crazy Christian because we dare to actually believe in in every word of the Bible because we actually believe what the Bible says. We've come to that place in culture where it's okay, maybe sort of kind of to be a Christian, but if you actually believe in the fundamental tenets of the word of God and you believe every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, if you believe that all of it is efficacious for your life, then now you're a crazy person. You're a loon, you're a bat, you're maybe even a psychopath, and you certainly shouldn't have free speech, probably, maybe not, probably not a good idea to have free speech, probably a good idea to, you know, squash your opinions on social media and find ways to just try to tone us down a little bit. I think that's where the world is now, but we're quickly moving beyond just trying to squash us and silence us and subtly push us to the shadows and the corners. Eventually, it's going to be a more overt silencing, a more overt persecution, to use a scary word. But I do believe that's coming if the Lord tarries. In fact, we know if the Lord tarries that that has to come, right? If you believe the Bible, you know that a certain level of persecution has to come, whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, somewhere after all of that trib, it doesn't matter. At some point, you're probably going to face some kind of persecution, and we have to be ready for that. And I think that when a holiday like the 4th of July comes around and we look back at the, the founding of our great nation, people say that we mythologize the founding of our country. I think the reality is that modern educational structures want to go back and destroy all of the the foundations and the goodness of what this country is built on. Certainly, the reality that this country was built and shaped around the Word of God, the Bible, around Christianity specifically, not just religion, but Christianity specifically, although because it was rooted in the Word of God and in a Christian mindset, The founders wanted there to be freedoms that would extend to other religions and other people, other denominations. The founders knew better than anyone that Christians can persecute Christians better than anybody else. And because they knew that, they put safeguards in place to protect us from that kind of interreligious persecution that happens. We even see it now happening in the modern day world in the Middle East, Muslims persecuting other Muslims, religious infighting and hatred towards one another differing and opposing views within a similar structure of religion. The United States of America was designed and formulated in a way to try to protect us from that kind of infighting. It was even designed to protect people who did not have a quote unquote religious faith or a belief in God. This is a good thing. This is what liberty is. This is what freedom is in in the secular world. Now, I wanted to just take a few moments in light of it being the 4th of July weekend, and I wanted to talk to you about uh, what I call the responsibilities of freedom. And I want to switch gears. I want to switch away from the secular ideas of freedom or what we might would think of as political freedom thought. And I want to look at the biblical spiritual ideas of freedom, although the Bible does support secular freedoms, political freedoms, and all of those things. That's not what I want to focus in on today. If I wanted to do that, I'd just read the Declaration of Independence. But I want to look at the biblical responsibilities of freedom. And to do that, first, we have to define what freedom is. I love this quote from Thomas Paine, even though I don't like many quotes from Thomas Paine. He was kind of crazy sometimes. But he said this, Those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigue of of supporting it. This is so true. Freedom is fatiguing. It takes work. It takes effort to uphold freedom, to keep freedom. You have to fight for it. You have to struggle for it. I like this quote from George Bernard Shaw. Liberty means responsibility, and that is why most men dread it. Boy, if that isn't true, I don't know what is true. 
when we realize that freedom and liberty means that we have individual responsibilities, that we're actually the ones who are supposed to lift ourselves up by the bootstraps and do what God's called us to do. When we realize that, then there's a, a kind of unsettling that happens, especially, I think, in people who have have been raised in a way where they're not taught individual responsibility can be very startling to realize, Hey, I'm supposed to actually do some things. I'm supposed to have to fight for my Liberty. So the first thing that I think we should understand about freedom and Liberty is that it comes from God. Now I'm going to do this from a theological viewpoint. So I want to take you to Genesis chapter two, the book of beginnings, Genesis two, 16 through 17 says this and the Lord God commanded the man being Adam saying, of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. You can freely eat of every single piece of fruit, every tree, everything in the garden is yours. Verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So here we see, in my opinion, the first establishment of God-given freedom. And we say, well, freedom means I can do anything I want. No, freedom doesn't mean that. Freedom doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. We live in the freest country in the world, and yet you still do not have the liberty to walk down the street and shoot someone at will. Why? Is it because you're not free? No, you are free. But there are certain things that are not within the purview of human rights and human freedom, because freedom comes from a higher power. Freedom comes from the ultimate authority, the lawgiver, who is God. And so God was establishing this authority even before sin entered into the world with Adam and Eve, and he told them, listen, you really have, really Adam and Eve had what I would consider to be the freest moment in human history. They could literally do anything they wanted to do except one solitary thing. They could not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, it's interesting when the serpent comes in later and he's tempting Eve to eat the fruit, he misquotes God. Now, this is important because the adversary will always try to confuse your mind about what God actually said. Satan said, God told you if you touch the fruit, that you'll surely die. God never said that. God said that if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in that day, thou shalt surely die. So freedom had a caveat, and the caveat was you have the freedom that God gives you, and when God says your freedom stops, that where that's where it stops. When God says you can do this, this, and this, and this, but not that, that's where your freedom ends because freedom comes from God. Now, I want to show you this. This is Numbers chapter 11, verse 4 and 6. And I want to juxtapose these two passages of Scripture. Numbers chapter 11, verse 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? Verse 5. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. Oh, no. There's nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. There's nothing beside this heavenly, God-given provision, this bread that God gives us every single morning that tastes, some scholars say, like milk and honey, perhaps. There's nothing besides this bread. And this is all we have, and there's nothing else. And so they started looking back to Egypt. Now, you have to remember, you have to put this in context in your mind. They are making the assertion, the Israelites complaining to Moses while they're, of course, wandering in the wilderness. They're making the assertion to God and to Moses. We're not free like we used to be back in Egypt. We can eat this manna, but it's all we have. At least in Egypt, we could have some garlic and we can have some fish and onions and maybe we might get a little steak dinner every once in a while, but they were not, they were not remembering correctly. 
because if they could have gone back in their mind, see, we have this way of romanticizing the past. We rewrite history in our own lifetimes. We talk about rewriting ancient history. We rewrite modern history, the history of our own lives, and we look at it through these false lenses. But if they could have gone back and correctly remembered, they would know that in Egypt they were beaten and murdered. Their babies were thrown in the sea to die. It was mass genocide. They were building bricks and pyramids for a Pharaoh who hated them. They were beaten every day. They died in mud pits with straw every single day. It was a horrible, awful life. The 400 plus years in Egypt, it was a horrendous lifestyle. And now, because all they have is manna and they're tired of it, They start looking at the freedom that God has given them from that oppression. And now they're saying, oh, this Christian liberty sure is oppressive. See, we do this today as well. We forget that freedom comes from God. And we forget that the ultimate oppression comes from the enemy of our soul, the adversary, Satan himself. We forget it so quickly. And we start looking at, oh, God wants me to do this and God wants me to be modest and God wants me to, you know, avoid that. And God's telling me I can't do that. And I got to be at church and, oh, I got to hear preaching again. I got to get manna one more time. See, that's, that's the, the flesh nature that creeps up on us. And we forget the proper definition of spiritual freedom. The proper definition of spiritual freedom is that we have been delivered from the captivity of sin and bondage and from the grip of hell and Satan himself. And now we walk in the liberty to serve God, love God, and have a relationship with God with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our minds, and with all our strength. That's what real freedom is. But the devil wants to flip the definition of freedom upside down on you, especially when you're in a wilderness. You'll start mixing up your definitions really fast, and you'll start looking at at captivity as freedom, and you'll start thinking freedom is bondage. And before you know it, you're saying crazy things like, man, at least back in At least back in Egypt, things were pretty good. At least back when I was bound by alcohol and drugs, at least I was able to do that. I mean, (laughs) I didn't have a preacher. I didn't have Moses breathing down my neck telling me to get up every morning and pick manna up off the ground. See, that's how the devil gets us because, because freedom is something that comes from God. God defines what it is and what it is not. We don't get to define it. And it's always been that way from the beginning of time. It's still that way today, even though societies want to ignore it. Now, the next thing that I want to point out to us is from Psalm 54, verse 6. And it's what I call sacrificial freedom. The psalmist said this, I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I will praise thy name, O Lord, for it is good. I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I will praise thy name, O Lord. For it is good. That line at the very beginning, I will freely sacrifice unto thee. The Hebrew word there rendered freely means with willingness, voluntariness, spontaneousness. The idea is that he would do it of a free or willing mind. Some translations say, I will offer a free will offering unto thee, O Lord. But even that doesn't really capture the idea of what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, of my own accord, with a willing mind, without constraint, no one's making me do it. No one's compulsing me to do it. No one's forcing me. No one's grabbing me by the collar and dragging me to a praise service. No one's tugging my arm and pulling me down to the altar. No one's forcing me to go to the prayer meeting. No one's forcing me to lift my hands. The idea here is that of a free will, as a voluntary spontaneous offering as distinguished from an offering that God prescribes by law. You know, the Bible does tell us to offer thanks, to come into his courts with praise, but the psalmist isn't talking about that. He's saying, I'm just spontaneously going to combust in praise. I have this, I have this sacrificial freedom. I have a freedom where 
because I'm so thankful for God and what he's done for me and his goodness to me, every once in a while, I just offer up this sacrifice of praise. And it isn't because my pastor's making me do it. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, someone beside me. No one's making me do it. My wife's not making me do it. I just love God. And I'm so thankful for the freedom and the liberty that he's giving me that I'm going to erupt with this sacrificial offering of praise. And it's going to come out of a heart of thanksgiving and love. I think that's powerful because when we truly walk in the liberty and freedom of the spirit, we're going to offer sacrifices to God that are not coerced. They're not prescribed by law. They're not forced. I could take it to money for a moment, and I'm not doing this to spark any kind of conviction or make anybody feel uncomfortable, but it's just a good analogy. In in the word of God, we have we have this prescribed 10% that we give of our increase of our out of what we make. We, we give 10%. In fact, the Bible teaches that we don't really give it. It's already his. God considers that 10% portion to be his. In fact, all of it is God's a hundred percent of what we make is actually God's because he owns it all. And God says, I'm going to let you keep 90% of what I gave you. You're just going to, You're just going to offer, you're going to tithe 10% of that back to me. And then God said, and so that's law that there's no arguing with that. We may do it with a good spirit. We may do it with a bad spirit. Sometimes, sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we walk in the blessing of it and we know that God blesses us for it and we see it in our lives and that's wonderful. But offerings are separate from tithes because God doesn't give us a number. He doesn't tell us how often we have to bring an offering. He doesn't tell us a percentage. The Bible just teaches, here's the principle in a nutshell. According to your gratitude, according to your thankfulness, according to how much you love and appreciate God, you'll give offerings which are separate from your tithes. And so offerings are a sacrificial, spontaneous offering of freedom. In other words, the freedom produces a willing sacrifice inside of us where we say, I love God so much. I'm so thankful for what he's done that I'm giving this free will offering. No one's making me do it. No one's forcing me to do it. I'm doing it according to my love for God. So in many ways, offerings are a much bigger deal than our tithes because our tithes are law, but our offerings are an act of worship to God where we're saying, Lord, I'm giving you this this sacrificial offering as an act of worship to you because I love you and I'm thankful for everything that you've done for me. So offerings are an amazing thing. And freedom makes us generous people. It does. People who truly walk in freedom, especially spiritual freedom, are generous. Look at Matthew 10 and 8. And I'm not just talking about financial freedom, although that's true, but I want us to see what Jesus said. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Any of y'all been doing that lately? I hope so. Cast out devils. And then he said this, freely ye have received, freely give. There's a quote from a novelist, Marilyn Robinson, that I like. She said this, generosity is also an act of freedom, a casting off of the constraints of prudence and self-interest. People who have freedom and who have received much, give much freely. If you've been healed, you ought to pray for others. If you've been cleansed, you ought to be in altars praying for the cleansing of others. If you've had devils cast out of you, if you've been raised from the dead, you ought to be in altars and in prayer meetings and in environments where you are travailing with others on their behalf, believing through faith and prayer and supplication. Freely do this with and for others. Give these spiritual gifts. If God's given you a spiritual gift, freely offer it to others. Don't make it about mammon. Don't make it about money. If it becomes about those things, God will take it from you. He'll take the anointing from you. But if you offer these spiritual gifts to others out of love, out of thankfulness, or thanksgiving for the freedoms God's given you, you will be amazed at how things will blossom out of your life and through others and in others. 
and it'll be like a, a stream of water that just courses through a dry land as 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 you minister to someone and then they minister to someone else starting another tributary and then they minister to someone else you've never met and it starts another tributary but it 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 all is connected what an amazing thing that is and freedom must be preserved it must be preserved i grew up in the ronald reagan era but I grew up just really enjoying the speeches of, of Ronald Reagan. He really was, in my opinion, the greatest speech giver of all modern American presidents, or at least presidents in my lifetime. And he said this, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected and handed on for them to do the same. Now, he was talking about our, our political freedoms and all of those things, but religiously and spiritually, this is important to understand. Just because my dad or my mom or my grandmother, I, I'll tell you, I had tremendous, tremendous grandparents. They're with the Lord right now on my mother's side. Both of them are with the Lord. I want to talk about God-fearing praying, faithful people who shook the foundations of hell with the simplicity of their faith in God. They didn't preach conferences. They never went on missions trips around the world, but they shook the foundations of hell with the simplicity and the profundity of their faith. Amazing, amazing people, O'Neill and Janine Smith were. And, and they understood for their children to serve God, it wasn't going to be passed down through their through their genes because our genes are flawed. We know that sin came from Adam and it flows through us. And they knew that it was going to take the blood of Jesus applied to their lives for them for them to be saved. And Galatians 6 1 is addressing, pardon me, Galatians 5 1 is addressing a similar thing. I want to read it to you here. It says this stand fast, therefore, in the liberty of wherewith Christ hath made us free. In other words, you've got to be firm in the liberty that Christ gave you and made you free initially with. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Paul knew, even though you can be saved, you can be delivered, you can be healed, all of those things that we like to shout about on Sunday mornings. You can get entangled back in those old webs all over again if you don't learn to preserve your freedom. If God delivered you from something, stay delivered from it. If God set you free from something, don't go back and get the sticky webs of that, that addiction stuck all over you again. Stay away from it. Stand fast in the freedom that God gave you. And stay away from things that might entrap you or ensnare you back into old bondage. You know, if you had actually been a physical slave in Egypt, it would be crazy if you were wandering around in Egyptian streets and kind of sneaking around just hoping a slave master didn't grab you and put you back into slavery. And yet people do this in modern things and in spiritual things, you know. We play around with watching things and listening to things and going to places and friendships that we know are dangerous that could ensnare us back into sin. But people who are serious about their spiritual freedom, they're serious about their salvation, they're saved and they want to stay saved. People like that, they get away from things that could entangle them again with the yoke of bondage. This is very, very important. I want to read Revelation 22 and 17 because freedom calls other people to freedom. If you've been set free, this is, by the way, the crux of the gospel. It's the crux of what we refer to as the Great Commission, that if you've been set free, you're called to help set someone else free. It's not just for your pastor. It's not just missionaries, evangelists. You, every single child of God, is called to reach out to others and help them be set free. And Revelation twenty two seventeen says it powerfully, and the Spirit and the bride, that's me, that's you, that's the church, say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. When the church and the Spirit of God 
work together in unity to call and reach out to a thirsty world, that's when revival takes place. When people who have been set free are connected to the spirit and they start crying out into the wilderness, thirsty people begin to hear that clarion call and they're drawn to the living water as the spirit and the church, the bridegroom, they work together as one and they minister to a broken world. And we have but a short time to do this. I want to close out. I love this quote by Rosa Parks. You're not sure who Rosa Parks is. She was, she wasn't actually the first African-American woman to refuse to give up her, her seat and go to the back of the bus. The story has been a little convoluted over time, but she is the most well-known and famous because it happened at a pivotal time in Montgomery, Alabama. And it was during segregation, of course, and, and uh, the bus driver was telling her, you've got to get up and you've got to go to the back of, of the bus. And with grace and with dignity, she simply refused. And she began to change the world. She was pivotal and instrumental in changing the world for the better and desegregating our culture in a way that was very wonderful, especially in, in the era where segregation was such a vile and horrific thing. She was quoted in her later years. She lived to be, I believe, 92. And she said this, I'd like to be remembered as a person who wanted to be free and wanted other people to be also free. How amazing is that? She wasn't just concerned with her freedom, but she wanted other people to be free as well. I think that's the heartbeat of a true child of God. We can't just be consumed with our own deliverance, our own salvation. We want to make it to heaven, but we want to do it bringing as many people with us as we possibly, possibly can. I hope you and your family have had a wonderful 4th of July weekend. I know it's over by the time you hear this. Uh, fireworks are going on outside my window right now. Uh, it's a Saturday. Tomorrow is the 4th of July. By the time you get this, because I know how long it takes me to edit, it'll be after the 4th of July or at the very tail end of it. But I hope you had a wonderful 4th of July. I hope you enjoyed your family. And I hope that you thought about your freedom. And I hope that you thought about it seriously. And, and I hope that you now, more than ever, refuse to take your freedom not just your political and secular freedoms but your spiritual freedoms refuse to take them for granted god bless you and your family